Good morning, dear saints, and blessed epiphany, and welcome to Thy Strong Word. Today is Monday, January 22nd, and you're listening to the program where each weekday morning we explore the holy scriptures through which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. Today, we're opening up a new book, or rather the third letter in our tri, uh, tr- our trilogy of Paul's letters. Uh, we've been looking at Ephesians, Philippians, and now we're into Colossians. So St. Paul begins this letter by expressing his thanks for the faith and the love that is evident in the Colossian church. He prays for their continued spiritual growth. But then he moves right into what he wants to tell them, and he powerfully asserts Christ's supremacy and his central role in creation and reconciliation. He shows Jesus to be the bridge between God and humanity. Then he also points to his own personal ministry struggles, but he underscores his commitment to spreading the gospel. I'm so grateful to all our listeners who tune in, whether it's over the air, online at kfuo.org, or through that KFUO app, Or maybe you're here listening on your own favorite podcasting app or smart speaker. No matter how you're tuning in, I'm just glad you're here. So settle in, open your hearts and your minds. We're about to begin. Thy Strong Word is graciously supported by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. LHF translates, publishes, and distributes books that are Bible-based, Christ-centered, and Reformation-driven. So when you get time, visit lhfmissions.org to learn more. And if you have any comments or questions about today's show, you can email me at pastorboo at gmail.com, or you can find me on Facebook also. Now, this episode's pre-recorded, but normally you could also call in with your comments or questions to 800-730-2727. So write that number down and maybe use it tomorrow. Well, joining us this morning, it's the Reverend Dennis McFadden. He's the pastor at a pastor at Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Good morning, Pastor McFadden. Welcome back to the program. Good morning, Pastor. It's nice to have you. This, this, uh, what are we, the third Sunday of Epiphany? I mean, Epiphany's just just trucking right along, or at least it is in the three-year series. It It, is. It's getting into pre-Lent for those one-year guys. Absolutely. Well, I'm glad to have you here as we open up this book. Uh, I tell you what, there's really nothing to do but to get started. So before we dive into the Word, would you start our time together in prayer? I thank you, my Heavenly Father, that in your great mercy you have caused your holy word to be so freely proclaimed and presented to us for our comfort, poor sinners that we be. O God, press and seal it upon our hearts that we may follow it in living and dying. Grant that we may always grow and increase in the knowledge of you. Let it be known and published not only to ourselves, but also to the nations, that it may stir and water the hearts of all men as the rain and snow water the earth and make it fruitful. Let us so know, call upon, honor, and thank you, eternal God, that ruling all our deeds according to your holy commandments, we may ever be found obedient children and finally be made partakers of eternal life and the inheritance purchased for us by Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, I'll tell you what, we've covered uh, Ephesians, Philippians. Now we're picking up Colossians. Uh, Before we even read any verses of it, though, it might be a good idea to give the folks a little background on why Paul is writing to the church in Colossa to begin with. Well, and that's that's an important thing to do, since I think for most of us Lutherans, uh, this is not the most familiar territory. We love Romans and we love Galatians with uh, emphasis on justification by faith. And in this letter, Paul doesn't spend the time dealing with justification as a legal uh, act by God declaring us righteous. And a lot of the common uh, elements of some of Paul's writings just aren't there. Uh, And yet uh, what we have is a robust and full-throated defense of Jesus Christ as the agent of God's work, who not only created and redeems, but also sustains all of life. And so it's a, it's a precious book. Uh, it's a practical one for us because uh, in dealing with the controversies that Paul dealt with, uh, it comes pretty close to home. Uh, the whole idea of being uh, spiritual but not religious, of thinking that uh, you can uh, find meaning in heavenly bodies that influence our lives, the idea that somehow we can... Uh, 
deny ourselves certain things and that will make us more spiritual. The idea that we can mix and match uh, elements of Judaism, Christianity, and Eastern religion. All of these things are in the mix in Paul's world. And so it's a real contemporary uh, letter for us to study. Uh, the city itself was about 100 miles east of Ephesus. Ephesus was there on the coast of Turkey, and Colossae was near to uh, Hierapolis and Laodicea, about 100 miles away. And Paul never uh, apparently visited the church, according to chapter 2. It probably was begun during his third journey when he spent three years in Ephesus, Acts chapter 19 tells us that during this time, the gospel spread through the whole province of Asia, and that would include uh, the church at Colossae. And so it probably was started um, during that third missionary journey uh, in, the, in the 50s, early 50s of, the, of that century. And now Paul is in prison in Rome in the early 60s, 60 to 62, uh, possibly with the founder of the uh, Colossian church, Epaphras. Uh, uh, chapter 4 tells us that Epaphras was with him in Rome, and in Philemon it calls him his fellow uh, prisoner, so he may have been in jail at the same time Paul was. And uh, Tychicus is going to take this letter uh, to the Colossian church, and he might have even been traveling with Onesimus, who pops up in the book of Philemon. Um, but that's a little bit of background as to what's going on. Apparently, uh, Paul had uh, some encouraging things about the church that he heard, but he also heard about a strange mishmash of false philosophy and Jewish ceremonialism and angel worship and asceticism. It was a, it was a real syncretistic soup of all kinds of bad ideas <laughs> that were uh, affecting the, the believers there. And so... Paul writes this, and when he does so, uh, he maybe we should say he co-writes it with his his good friend Timothy. Right. Uh, Timothy's mentioned in both Thessalonians' letters. Uh, he helped uh, evangelize Corinth. He helped with 2 Corinthians and maybe even Romans. He traveled with Paul to Jerusalem. Uh, he helped Paul with uh, the letters to the Colossians, Philemon, and Philippians. And uh, Paul may actually have sent him to Philippi and encouraged him to stay at Ephesus uh, for a time. And Paul calls him back to Rome, possibly during the winter. So uh, you could call Timothy Paul's number one protege. Yeah, I think that's good. And I like that idea of the syncretistic soup of bad ideas. I, I think that's worth it because we see here that he really is pushing back against a lot of human philosophies and traditions and false teachers and and strict rules about what you can eat and drink and religious festivals. And, and so Paul's writing to these folks. Now, from what I've read and, and what I've learned over the years, Paul probably never met the folks at Colossae. Would you say that's the case? I would agree. Uh, that that's the that's the inference I draw from chapter mm -hmm. two, that uh, this is not a church that he ever got uh, to visit, but it's a church he knew about because he got constant reports from his uh, associates about it, particularly Epaphras. And and I suspect Epaphras might have been the founder of that church. And now Epaphras is in Rome with Paul during his first imprisonment. And I'm sure that there was plenty of time for him to fill Paul in on all the ins and outs and the, and the personalities of members of the congregation and all of that. So Paul writes from afar, but not without real depth of, of concern and, and Christian love for these people. And he wants to be sure that he contradicts and confutes the, the false teaching that was going on there. And in doing so, in this first chapter, he gives us one of the most glorious statements about who Jesus Christ is that you'll find in the entire New yeah, Testament. Absolutely. We'll be getting to that probably after the break. <laughs> but for now, we're going to go ahead and pick up with chapter 1, verse 1. And uh, I'll read till it makes sense to stop. Here we go. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossa, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, 
since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Let's just take a pause right there. That's the end of verse 8. So we have his pretty ordinary uh, opening, right? He, who it's from, who it's to, and a little bit of a, a grace to you and peace, right? So it's, it's kind of a pretty common opening for this letter, for any letter, really. It really is. And, and actually, it's one long sentence in the Greek. <laughs> yeah. So verses, verses 3 to 8 are, are one long Pauline sentence. He's famous for those, what we might call a run-on sentence. He and, is. And, and here's, here's <laughs> been my, uh, I, I don't know, my speculation about it, and it's not new to me, but I just think Paul is, is just that type of, of zealous, excited person to get out the message that he just sort of stream of consciousness, right, just puts it on the page. That's not taking away yeah. from its inspired aspect. I'm just saying, you know, he's, he, he's excited about writing to these people. Well, and the Holy Spirit certainly used the personality of Paul and the personality of mm -hmm. Timothy uh, to communicate his inerrant word uh, to those people. And right here at the beginning, what jumps out is that in Christ, and that's what animates Paul's excitement. It is because of Jesus Christ. It is because of our participation in him and in his death and resurrection, we are in Christ. And that's a that's a, a phrase that Paul uses more than 80 times, uh, 83 times, I think. He, he uses the exact expression, in Christ. But then if you add the times he says, in the Lord, or with Christ, or into Christ, or through Christ, it swells the count considerably. So Paul interprets all of life through the lens of what does it mean to be in Christ. And so when we get after the break to who Christ is and what he's done, that just highlights and underscores why he is as excited as he is, because to be in Christ is is to have everything. Oh, indeed. And and he's really focusing, too, here. I mean, we see he's talking already about the false teachers, even in verse 6, right? So he says the, the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the word of truth, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world, is bearing fruit and increasing as it does among you. But he's, he's trying to already focus on the fact that there is a truth, and that truth is from Jesus. So we are, you know, hundreds of years before postmodernism would, would rush in with a lot of doubt about the possibility of objective truths and having people be moral, uh, relatively uh, relativistic in their moral uh, compasses. But we already see here that he is focusing on, on faith and hope and love, that sort of triad that he often brings up. It's already being explained here at the very top of his letter. Mm -hmm. That's that's where I was going to go next, <laughs> is the fact of the of, of faith, hope, and love. Uh, it, it some of Paul's letters as Romans focus on the on the verdict God speaks of not guilty on us because of Jesus Christ and what he did. Here he anticipates that Christian hope that gives rise to faith. Faith looks looks forward in hope, and what is it it looks for? It it isn't just the idea of going to heaven, but it's participating in the in the redeemed cosmos. Uh, I love the way uh, Lutheran Hour Ministries uh, published that series of videos that Greg Seltz did on God Connects, and in the one on the end of time, he uh, picturesquely describes. Uh, the new creation as Eden 2.0. And Paul has this clear sense in Colossians that the one who created the world is, is also the one who will bring uh, the new order to bear. And we will, in the end of time, have Eden 2.0 uh, again, and that will be our heavenly destiny. And that Christian hope is something that draws us toward the future. Our faith uh, anchors us in the fact of what Jesus did uh, on the cross and in his resurrection. Uh, uh, Christian hope uh, points us toward the future. 
and allays our fears and our anxieties. And that gives us space in the present uh, to exhibit love. Uh, once you're anchored and you don't have to worry about what you've done in the past, and once you look forward in hope to where you're headed, uh, you're set free from both guilt and anxiety that you can devote yourself to love here in the present. And that's exactly what uh, uh, Paul calls uh, them to do. Um, and it's it's really beautiful the way he does that. Tell us a little more Tell us a little I, more about Epaphras, right? So in 7, he says, as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he's a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. Uh, exactly what is he talking about? Well, he's talking about the fact that that Epaphras not only uh, most likely was the founder of the church and a native of Colossae, uh, but Paul describes him in chapter four as a faithful servant of Christ. He's fervent in praying for for uh, the fellow believers. He's he's zealous for them. Uh, verse thirteen of chapter four says, uh, in Philemon he calls him his fellow prisoner, and so here is someone who has stood shoulder to shoulder in the suffering of the gospel. He hasn't shirked his duty. He hasn't taken a, uh, uh, a pass. He hasn't called in sick. Uh, he's, he's stuck with the task of proclaiming that good news, and he's communicated it to Paul, and he has come all the way to Rome uh, to share with Paul what is happening with the Colossian church and to receive apostolic direction from Paul on what to do next. And, uh, that is an enormous sacrifice on his part, and it and it it shows us how absolutely committed he was to those people. You know, and it rem- he reminds and me of Epaphroditus, who we turned, who we learned about in Philippians, right? <laughs> kind of the same yeah, thing. Yes. There's this messenger going back and forth, a, a minister. I mean, he says a minister. Do you suspect that he was like in a pastoral role? Or do you think that this minister is, in the more broad sense, that he's just taking care of the saints and taking care of Paul? Well, I suspect, given the fact that many Bible scholars believe he was the founder of the church, that that he had a leadership role in that congregation, whether we would call him a pastor or an elder, uh, he certainly uh, seems to have had a, an eldership or leadership role uh, with the Colossian church, and he's respected for it. Well, let's... I, I'm also struck. I'm also struck by the fact that uh, notice that that Paul not only pours forth thanksgiving uh, in ver- in verse three, he says, "We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you." Uh, that attitude of thanksgiving uh, reminded me of how uh, Luther uh, concludes uh, the small catechism discussion of Article One for all. This it is my duty to thank and praise, serve and obey Him, and that idea of the of the so what of response to what God has done is to thank and praise, serve and obey Him, and that that pours forth too. I mean, we often think about the pluralistic aspects of our society. When you when you look around, you see all these different paths that people are declaring to truths that all, of course, can't be true. And, and, and we think of this as a, a, a contemporary idea, a postmodern idea, but put yourself in the, you know, in the place, folks at home, in the place of the Colossians. You know, a lot of these folks have come over from, from paganism. They still have friends who worship all these other different deities and have all these different practices, some of them incredibly inconsistent with Christian behavior. And so the fact that Jesus comes around and he gives them faith, hope, and love, but as we're also going to see, knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, he gives them truth, then he is the anchor that they can rest upon. So anxiety occurs, at least in the context of of, of faith here, when you're like, well, I don't know what's true. I don't know what's right. Who's right? How can we all, you know, believe that, that, that there's some sort of force out in the universe, but we all have different opinions about it? Who can we know is true? And, and, and Paul and is saying, right, Christ has come. He's brought you the truth. And that's going to become really important as we move into the next section. And, and it's— Oh, when right. we get—yeah, when we get to the latter part right. of the chapter, he's going to make a very full-throated uh, affirmation that rather than the uncertainty of, of, the, of the mixing and matching of a little bit of this and a mm-hmm. little bit of that, uh, Jesus Christ, much as, as the book of Hebrews says— 
Jesus Christ is superior to everything. He's superior to Moses. He's superior to the angels. He's superior to any human mediation. And he's going to make the same kind of statement here, that Jesus is the answer and Jesus is the basis for our certainty. And this is important for us today because we are being called to stand up for that same truth. And we can trust when we found our opinions, when we establish our hope in the scriptures uh, on Christ. So let's keep on going. I'm going to read, I'm going to add to our conversation verses 9 through 14. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints and his light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So we'll pause there at the end of 14. So we have another triad, right? Knowledge, wisdom, understanding. But then also what's what's remarkable to me and stands out, as you said earlier, this isn't something we hear in Lutheran circles as much as some of the others, but maybe, maybe it's because of our heritage. Because look here, verse 10, he says, you guys need to go out and live this faith. You need to walk in a manner worthy yeah. of this knowledge, wisdom, understanding, you know, faith, hope, and love that God has given you. I think sometimes we don't emphasize the good works that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in, in our Lutheran circles, not as much as we should. Well, and and verses 10, 11, and 12 give the, uh, use ING words to show the result of a God-pleasing life, bearing fruit, verse 10, growing in knowledge of God, verse 10, spiritual strength, being strengthened with all power, verse 11, thankfulness, verse 12. These are the, these are the natural results, uh, as our, formula of Concord tells us, that are produced by a life that is redeemed. It's it's going to bear fruit. It's going to grow in knowledge of God. It's going to evidence spiritual strength, and it's going to uh, have a thankful spirit. Oh, absolutely. And, and it's not as though Paul is somehow changing the rules about Christian life or Christian faith. In 12, he makes it clear. You're already giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness. So yeah. obviously, justification, salvation is God's work, but we shouldn't just focus on that to the neglect of what it means to live out that Christian faith in action, you know, in love. The problem we constantly have is that we seem to think that uh, the things the New Testament describes by sanctification as walking worthy are the things that will earn us standing with God. And those are really the consequences of the results of right standing with God. We have a right standing with God because of the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ and the fact that uh, we have died and risen with Christ in baptism, that we feed upon Christ in the sacrament of the altar, uh, that we hear the forgiving word of Christ in the gospel message of the sermon. And all of these things point us. Uh, toward that that response that, that Luther talks about, about uh, having a grateful spirit that evidences itself in, in praise and thanksgiving and, and uh, right, uh, fruitful Christian living. Absolutely. I, and, and I guess just as I look out from the pulpit uh, in my congregation and then virtually, <laughs> I try to put myself in the, in, the, in the pulpit of my brothers, you know, I, I do have, I have to comment that you know, in Luther's day, because of the way that the, the, the church proclaimed that there was this need to practically merit your own salvation, I mean, that's a little, that's not as nuanced as it really is, but still, people were struggling. They were in despair over striving to, to live a good enough life so that God would accept them. Uh, so Luther comes around and he proclaims the truth that he himself discovers about Christ's work and, the, you know, how we're saved by by faith, not through our works. But as we look out into the, into the pews today, I don't know that we see people clamoring, trying to work their way into heaven as much as we see people who kind of sit back on their laurels and think that, 
well, yes, I have faith and love and knowledge and wisdom, but it's all sort of head knowledge, right? That the knowledge that's talked about yeah. here is an experiential knowledge. You know God, you trust his will, you obey his commands. So that's why I bring that up. But you're right. You're right. It's, not, just, it, it's easy and, to fall not, off on either side of the horse. Go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say, not only that, but it is, you know, so often, uh, you know, there are always some people that think that knowledge is an end in itself or knowledge is there uh, to credential my intelligence, but it isn't knowledge. It's that experiential knowledge. It's, it, it's a compound word in the Greek that, that indicates a genuine, deep kind of experiential knowledge, but it's knowledge of his will. And it isn't just wisdom. It's wisdom that is married to spiritual understanding or understanding of the working of the spirit, how the spirit intends uh, to work in our lives. And so when Paul says, I pray that you'll be filled with the kind of knowledge and the kind of understanding that doesn't sit on a, you know, sit around and contemplate its navel, but a kind of a, 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 a knowledge and understanding that, that impels you uh, to acts of gratitude for what God has done for you, bearing fruit, growing in knowledge of God, spiritual strength, thankfulness, those kinds of things. And he makes that shift, too, about where this all comes from when he talks about the Father who's qualified you. Um, now, but he talks about, 13, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. Of course, Christ being the King of kings. But that language of the domain of darkness. You know, we think of Paul when we think, I'm no, pardon me. We think of John. We think of John when we see this juxtaposition between light and darkness as in his gospel. But even in Ephesians, Paul says things like, you know, we are not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against the cosmic powers over this present darkness. That language of darkness, blindness, uh, is kind of interesting in light of the world who kind of prides itself in being woke <laughs> uh, to use a term yep. from my Sunday morning Bible studies that I'm doing right now, but they, they, they see themselves as sort of, they see, whereas no one else is, is sees until they also yeah. wake up and become woke. But, but here it, it's really talking about that same thing, but in a real way, you know, the, the light of Christ shines on things. We are being transferred from darkness into light. I, I just think that's something that, that is worth noting. It it echoes so many passages in 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 First John and also in 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 uh, in Peter's letters that talk the same way about uh, from darkness into light and and that is an important theme through Scripture. Notice that it says that it evolves a kingdom and a kingdom has a king, a kingdom has a rule, a kingdom has a people, a kingdom has a land or a place, and a kingdom has a law. And we're being moved out of the realm of this world with its with its authorities to one that is put under the authority of and sovereignty of Jesus Christ. He is the king, not uh, any temporal power, not any uh, penultimate answer to existence. It's Jesus Christ. He is the ultimate authority. He is the ultimate uh, ruler of the universe. And that's going to come out even more after the break, when we look at that great Christ hymn and uh, Jesus proclaims himself to be the king. And so if he's the king and we're his, his uh, servants, uh, subjects, we are called to be under him and to experience the light of his rule. As he said uh, in Matthew's gospel uh, to, to bear the yoke of discipleship and uh, his yoke is not heavy, uh, but it is light. Yeah. You know, and I think this, and we are right up against the break, but I think this image of a kingdom is a little foreign to we Americans, right, who who live in a constitutional oh, republic. We have a little bit of say and influence over over the rules that govern us, and yet that's not how it works for God. And, and this is why we find some churches voting on things like which parts of the Bible to keep and which ones to throw out or what doctrines to believe and what not to believe. You don't get to vote on doctrine, right? It's it's a it's a kingdom, but I tell you what, we're gonna have to hold that as we take our break, folks. Don't go anywhere. In just a few moments, it won't be any time at all. When we return, Pastor McFadden and I will keep on talking about Colossians chapter one. We'll move into that next section that we've been teasing. We'll see you on the other side.
These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help, because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan316. Welcome back to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo. With me today is the Reverend Dennis McFadden, a pastor at Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Don't forget, folks, that you can contact me at PastorBoo at gmail.com or on Facebook with your comments, questions, and more. I love hearing from you, and I do my best to write back to everybody who uh, writes in. So now here we are back with my guest, Pastor McFadden, and we've been chomping at the bit to get into it. Let's go ahead and do it. We're going to be in verse 15. Here we go. Speaking of Christ, of course, Paul writes, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Uh, I know it's right in the middle of the thought, but let's pause there. So here we have, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Starting there, unpack that for us, brother. Well, we begin with that idea of the image. Uh, To say that Christ is the image of the invisible God is to speak of his likeness. He's the exact likeness, the mirror image, as Hebrews would say uh, in chapter 1, verse 3, of of God. He's the representation. He represents God to us. And as John would say in in his first chapter, he's the manifestation of God. Um, The word in John 1 says he is the exegesis of the Father. He He is the explaining of who the Father is. And so when it says that he is the image of the invisible God, uh, it is as Jesus said to uh, his disciples and to those around him, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He is the very image of the invisible God. And that kind of picks up the two strands that in Genesis, you get mankind created in the image of God, and you've got that assertion, but then there's that that idea of the biblical background of Christ as the image of God in terms of of the the notion of wisdom in the Old Testament, in the book of Proverbs, the book uh, of Psalms, speaking of wisdom. And so Jesus is that image of God. He goes on, he says, everything is, as you you quoted it, through him, in him, for him. Three short strokes that capture everything God does in creation and redemption. I mean, if you want to know God, you have to know Jesus. I mean, I think that's pretty much how it is. You know, you you can't find the fullness of God in a a stream or a beautiful mountain view or a sunrise. You can't find the fullness of God anywhere but in Christ. I think that's what people struggle with because we so, and I say we broadly as human beings, it seems like ever since we lost the image of God, we search for God everywhere, but where God makes him known. It just it's like a it's like a defect in 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 the way that our fallen sinful human natures operate. And when we and when we try to create ideas on our own of where to find God, we we end up in in miserable cul-de-sacs every single time. To try to seek God in morality, or to try to seek God in mysticism, or to try to seek God in in uh uh knowledge for its own sake. Uh, these are, are, are avenues that will not deliver the goods, will not get us home to where we want to be. We find the, the ultimate meaning uh, in, of God in Jesus Christ, his dear son. And so that, 
jumps out in this in this chapter. Well, and there's and there's a phrase here that I think can be a little confusing, and that is the phrase of the firstborn. I mean, he says he's the firstborn of all creation and the firstborn from the dead. We confess in our creeds that Jesus, of course, is not created but begotten, but Christ, in terms of his second person of the Godhead, nature has always existed. So how do we explain this firstborn of all creation? I think firstborn of the dead is a little easier, but how do we explain those types of terms when we talk about Jesus to folks? Well, it, it it's used in two different ways. You can speak of firstborn in terms of priority of time, uh, the first one to come along. Uh, I have five ch- children, and my firstborn was the one who was born first. You can also use the term firstborn in, in Greek thought, in Roman thought, to refer to priority uh, of supremacy or rank. Uh, uh, the first man, uh, the top dog, the head enchilada. We, we use all kinds of phrases to refer to someone who has supreme authority or priority in an organizational structure. They are at the top of the structure. And we can use firstborn in that sense as well. Now, one thing it doesn't mean is what our Jehovah Witness friends think it means that Jesus was created. And the grammar argues against that for five reasons. First of all, the whole point of the passage in the book of Colossians is to show that Christ is superior over all things. Secondly, uh, other statements about Christ in the passage, such as creator of all in verse 16, upholder of creation, verse 17, show that he is superior over all creation. Thirdly, the firstborn can't be part of creation because if he was created, how do you explain the all things? He can't be supreme over himself and he can't create himself. Uh, And then fourth, the firstborn receives the worship from the angels in Hebrews 1 and we're, uh, creatures are pro- prohibited from being worshipped according to the Ten Commandments. So uh, that rules that out. And then finally, the Greek word for firstborn uh, doesn't mean first created. That's a different word. First created uh, is an entirely different word than this one. This one speaks of rank uh, more than than temporal priority. So It just doesn't mean what some of our friends in some of the cults think it means. It refers to his role as supreme overall. And that just, you know, bleeds through this whole section, the supremacy of Jesus Christ over everything, because these people were, were taking a little bit of Jewish ceremonialism and false philosophy and asceticism, denying the body and mysticism. And they were, they were They were stirring it all together in an unholy stew. And Paul is saying none of those constituent parts, and certainly not the combination of all of them, is able to answer the most basic problem of the human heart, only Jesus Christ, because he is the supreme over all of creation and redemption. As supreme over creation and redemption, he and he alone is the firstborn. And as you said, that's backed up not only by the literal statement that for by him all things were created, but in 18, you know, he's the head of the body. You've been talking about 17. He's before all things in him, all things hold together. It makes makes complete sense when you when you kind of go to the text and you understand it from its historical point of view, and you also understand it uh, with uh, with a hermeneutic, not of suspicion, not coming with your own thoughts, but you just (laughs) read the thing and hear what it says. But I will say what's a little more confusing, I think, is the the second half of 16. So he talks about he created, um, by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Now, Paul doesn't shy away from reminding us constantly that there is more to existence, there is more to the world even, or the universe, than what we can see. There are things that are invisible. And then he mentions whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Now, these terms, it seems to me that the simplest reading is that it's just emphasizing that Jesus rules over all other rulers, human rulers. But he's also talking about the invisible realm. So he certainly rules over angels and and demonic angels, 
But I, I've also seen a lot of ink spilled trying to take these terms and and make classifications or ranks or hierarchies of angels and demons. Do you have any comments on that yeah. at all? I sure do. Uh, <laughs> uh, when I was in, I did not attend a Lutheran seminary, and the seminary I attended, uh, one of the professors uh, got off the rails later in his life, and he started creating organization charts with different demons in order in each community. So he would say in a particular community, it might be Anaheim, he'd say, well, the demon of lust or the demon of jealousy or the demon of anger is the top dog here. And these are his subordinates and all this and very, very fanciful, mystical approaches. I think that there has been a tendency to go in one of two directions. Either these terms refer to angelic beings or these terms refer to social structures. And my answer is yes. That's because you're a Lutheran. <laughs> it's all it's 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 all of the above. I I love a quote that uh, it's a little bit extended, but let me read it to you. It's it's Leslie yes. Newbigin. He said, "The principalities and powers are real. They're invisible. We can't locate them in space. They don't exist as disembodied entities floating above this world or lurking within it. They meet us as embodied, invisible, and tangible reality. Peoples, nations, institutions. They're powerful." What is Christ's relation to them? They are created in Christ for Christ. Their true end is to serve him. They become powers for evil when they attempt to usurp the place which belongs to Christ alone. In his death, Christ has disarmed them. He has put them under his feet. They must now serve him. And the church is the agency through which this victory is made manifest and is affected and puts, as the church puts on the whole armor of God to meet and master them. And I think there's a sense in which the Colossian believers were worried about invisible, angelic beings, either good or evil. They were experiencing the power of the emperor cult. They were living in a society that was addicted, as ours is, to materialism uh, and wanted to make matter the measure of all things, uh, chasing after money and chasing after things. All of that. Uh, is money a good thing or a bad thing? It depends. If it is put into submission to Jesus Christ and used for his kingdom, then it is storing up treasure in heaven. If it's used in a selfish way to indulge one's passions and perversions, then it's a demonic thing. And the same goes for everything. So whether you're looking at angelic beings or whether you're looking at institutionalized expressions of societal structures, Jesus is Lord of all. He's Lord over the whole cosmos everything visible and invisible. And it it's kind of silly to start parsing it out into, well, this is visible, this is invisible. The point is, Jesus is Lord of all. He's Lord of the whole creation. And it is only as as what is in creation is, is turned to serve him that it has its highest purpose. I think that's very well said. And, and this whole fixating on trying to categorize things, I mean, we as humans do that anyway. I mean, think about how we classify plants and animals and, you know, all the different ways we classify them. And, and even now, I don't know how much you know about string theory or quantum physics, but, but oh, absolutely. science is looking for, <laughs> they're trying to discover literally what holds the world together, what holds the universe together. And they're looking in the smallest places and they're coming up with things like strings that contain that, you know, that consist of length, but not width. I mean, things that we don't understand, but, and I'm not trying to put too big or fine of a point on it, but, and this isn't to say we shouldn't continue our scientific investigations to know about God's creation, but 17 pretty much makes it clear, <laughs> right? In him, all things hold together. And so again, exactly. not to, not to overemphasize the point, but we search for God or the the purpose of the universe anywhere but where God has revealed it to us. So hey, if you're a if you're a quantum scientist, hey, please keep going. I think it's awesome, but also remember that Christ holds all things together. And all things have their meaning in him, and only when they're rightly oriented toward him are they able to fulfill their purpose. Oh. Any good gift can be perverted if it's used in a perverted way. But anything used to the glory of God is going to find its its ultimate purpose as ordered under him, who is fills all things and is all things. And I love 19 too, because you know, you have these folks who want to deny Christ's divinity. Paul makes it excruciatingly clear 
or in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. A very poetic, beautiful way to explain that in Christ, that's where we find and discover what God wants us to know about him. And, and I think that that as Lutherans, we have a, a kind of an added benefit here. A lot of our American evangelical friends operate with kind of a, a practical syllogism that goes like this. Faith saves. I have faith. I am saved. And the problem with that is in times of doubt or uncertainty, in times of despair, where do you look? If that's your syllogism, you look inward to measure either the quality of your faith or the quantity. Did I did I believe enough or was, did I believe genuinely enough? Or you end up looking outward at your, at your good works that you've done uh, in service and you get on this treadmill of performance. And it this kind of faith in times when we need assurance most either produces a, a sort of a smug inwardness, a pharisaical cockiness and arrogance, or it produces utter despair. And the point Paul makes is that we believe that God was fully in Jesus Christ. And we Lutherans describe that in, in three kinds of ways. We say that, that the person of Jesus uh, involved both natures, so that Jesus knew the hearts of those who sought to test him because he was God, and he hungered because he was a man. We say that, secondly, uh, the divine attributes describe him as a man as well as, as as God. So we can say that because God was fully in him, that, that in a real sense, wherever there's Jesus, uh, there is God. The man, Jesus, and God can't be separated. That, that final category says that um, not how Jesus was, but what he did, and it affirms the unity of those natures in the one person— so that any time we find him do, doing something in the Bible, Jesus doesn't just do it as God or do it as a man. He does it as God and man united together. Um, I love the verse in 1 John 1, 7, where it says, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And that kind of captures all three. First of all, the, the attributes of a single nature are spoken of as belonging to the whole Christ. Here, blood, a human attribute, is called the blood of the Son of God. And the whole person of Jesus Christ has blood because that attribute of his human nature. Second, the the, the second uh, category applies because it assigns divine majesty to that human nature. The human blood of Jesus Christ has power entirely divine to cleanse you and me and all of our listeners from all sins we've ever done, ever do, or ever will do. And then finally, neither nature ever acts alone. Uh, they they work together, and it says that the action here, cleansing from all sin, is an act of the one person, Jesus Christ, in whom both natures are united and in which both natures are involved. And so unlike some of our friends that, you know, want to go off on a rationalistic, you know, tear and parse Jesus out into divine and human as if it were two very, very separate things, we believe what Paul says in verse 19, in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and continues to dwell. And that is the blessed comfort of the believer today, I believe. Let's pick up with 19 and add some more verses to the conversation. I'll be reading through verse 23. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Uh, can't, once saved, always saved. Doesn't sound like it. Well, there there is certainly in Scripture a security of the believer, but there's also an insecurity of the unbeliever. And the warnings of Hebrews six and Hebrews ten remind us of that terrible possibility that despite the love of God, despite the fact that it is not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to a knowledge of the truth, despite the fact that 
that we were washed uh, in baptism and we were uh, declared, you know, I love how Peter puts it in 1 Peter 3. He says that baptism now saves us, not by the washing of dirt off the body. I've I've got five mm-hmm. kids and 13 grandkids, wow. and I've I've done a whole bunch of diaper changes, and I've had some blowouts. And I'll tell you, it takes a lot of wipes <laughs> to, to clean up a baby. And uh, a little bit of water sprinkled on the head can't take care of the dirt on the body. But it it what it does do through the the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is it guarantees us the pledge is from God to us, not from us to God. And it guarantees us that when we stand before the judge of all the uh, earth, we will have a clear conscience, not because of what we've done or not done, but because of what Jesus did for us as Moshef to us through his resurrection. He was handed over for our trespasses, Romans 4.25, and raised up for our resurrection and that reality gives us a certainty that 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 by clinging to his promises, we can be certain that we will have a clear conscience before the Lord. But that's not a ticket out of, you know, it's not a, a you know, a free pass uh, to deny the gospel, deny the Lord, to uh, become an atheist and then hope that somehow at the final judgment, we'll be able to slip in by the skin of our teeth because we were baptized, we attended church, or we memorized a certain number of Bible verses. There is that warning in Hebrews 6 and 10 that it's a fearful thing uh, to fall into the hands of an angry God. And and it is a horrible possibility that we don't ever want to consider that somebody might actually walk away from their faith in such a considered, deliberate, and final way that they reject the grace of God. Yeah. And so I would say the believer has security, but the unbeliever has no security. And if you put yourself in the ranks of the unbeliever, uh, no matter what you've done in the past or said in the past, you're an unbeliever. And it's something to to re- remember and recall. Now, Paul, he, he says, <laughs> in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. I, I don't know if it's his intent, but... Anytime Paul reminds us a little bit of his journey, it, it really is, I think, a mirror in to which we can see our ourselves. Right? We, whether you're came to faith as an infant yeah. or as an adult, you journeyed from being an enemy of God, and and then by extension, Jesus and His people, or uh, and you became, of course, brought into the faith by God. And so Paul talks about that same thing too. You know, I Paul became a uh, a minister. I, I'm going to read the next few verses. Now, it's a little odd because really the the chapter break comes, I think, in the middle of a thought by Paul, but I'm still going to read the first half of it to the end of the chapter just for completeness sake. We'll, We'll touch on it a little bit tomorrow when we pick up, but here we go, starting with verse 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Paul's going to keep on going with that thought in tomorrow's episode as we move into chapter two, but just this part, it it seems to focus on the mystery hidden for all ages. Uh, Maybe reveal that a little more clearly for us, brother, and wrap up anything else you want the folks to know about our text for today. Well, I would simply say that when Paul uses the word mystery, he's not using it the way the ancient Greeks used it in the mystery religions. He's using it to describe a revelation, a truth God has revealed now that was hidden or unknown in the Old Testament period. And the Old Testament looked forward to the coming of the Messiah. Uh, From Genesis 3 on, we're told that God made a promise and God keeps his promise and he's going to deliver his promise. And when the Messiah comes, he will fulfill the promise of God. And that good news of the coming of Jesus Christ to die and rise again for us, that, that announcement of the gospel is 
good news. It's not just good advice. It's good news uh, that is delivered to us. And Paul is reveling in the fact that he has the privilege of being the announcer, the purveyor, the teacher, the proclaimer of that good news everywhere he goes. He gets to gossip the gospel that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, and he has given us the message of reconciliation. And that animated Paul's entire life and drove him forward with zeal and excitement the way it, I hope it does us. The idea that that regardless of whether we are lifelong Christians or whether we are we came to Christ later in life, we have been redeemed. We are reconciled to God. Uh, Jesus is not only the creator, but he's also the redeemer and he's also the sustainer. And uh, the mystery of the good news of the gospel is our present possession to share everywhere. And with excitement, we do. I'm sure we could keep going. It's always great to have you on, but I think I will have to bring it to a close. We're at the end of our time, but I officially would like to thank my guest this morning, the Reverend Dennis McFadden, a pastor serving at Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Brother, thanks for being on the show. I love it when you're on. Thank you so much. I enjoyed being Folks, with you. Folks, tomorrow, the Reverend Samuel Powell comes on to, well, take us into the next chapter. In Colossians 2, the apostle delves deeply into the richness of Christ's work and the fullness of the believer's life in him. This chapter stands as a powerful reminder to Christians, really continuing the thought of the supremacy and sufficiency of Christ over all human traditions and philosophies. Paul warns against being led astray by deceptive teachings, and he emphasizes the importance of being rooted and built up in God who dwells bodily in Jesus. That and more tomorrow when we gather again around God's word. Until then, may God's peace and blessings be with you all as we pray, Father, keep us in thy strong word.